Welcome to Talking Points. My name is Dr. Stephen E. Gardner and I'm here to share with you a brand new series that we began. We are talking about harvest. It's harvest time. What time is it for you? A couple of weeks ago we dealt with part one. Today I want to delve into Part two of harvest time. What time is it for you? So let's look here. We came from Ecclesiastes chapter three, verse two, and here's a caption. There is a season for every human and a time for everything. For everything there's a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. And some versions say a time to sow and a time to also reap. Now this is what we learned last time in part one on harvest time. We learn that there are two types of time discussed in the Septuagint. Remember we said that any time that you see the capital LXX is referring to the Septuagint. And the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And so we learn that there are two types of time that are discussed there. Terms like Kairos and Kronos. And we celebrate all types of time according to Kronos. For example, anniversaries, birthdays, and revivals. We also learn that each of the major feast days of the Israelites was related to some type of harvest such as Passover or the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was usually marked the barley harvest sometime in April or May, Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks, which observed the wheat harvest in June, and the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles, which is usually celebrated sometime in October regarding the grape harvest. So based upon what we've read thus far, one could say, based on Israel's biblical history, that harvest can come several times within the year and not just once a year as so commonly celebrated here in America, especially if you live in uh, like the Midwest and other places like that where they may have corn and that you can all, they plant the corn in the early part of the year and then they harvest the corn in the evening. And so it is with other crops as well. Harvest time from the people of Israel we see can occur several times a year. So therefore we should expect a harvest at uncommon times, and in uncommon places. We learned also that there are metaphorical and figurative usages of the word harvest, such as the end of the age, or of believers sowing and reaping a spiritual harvest. There are also certain spiritual and prophetic meanings to the term kairos, such as a kairos moment. 
This is a specific kind of time that is transcendent to ordinary time. The kind of time where God intervenes, comes down, or steps into ordinary time, or shows up in specific times that is personal and subjective. You could say that relating back to the people of Israel, and if we go back to the one particular feast day, Pentecost, it was a it was a Kairos moment when he chose that particular feast day to pour out his spirit upon all flesh, as we find in Acts chapter 2. You could also say it was a Kairos moment if you go back to the Passover, where Jesus himself became the Passover lamb. And then when he hung there on the cross, the veil of the temple was rent as he gave up the ghost. So you find that these are specific kinds of time where God intervenes or interjects himself into personal, into times that are personal and subjective. Not only did it relate to them as a nation, but it can also relate to you and I as individuals. So my point here is that God can show up in any episode of our life to give us a message or to give us the revelation that he is there. Jehovah Shama means the Lord is there. Many times that's all we need when we're going through something or all we need as we are, as we are seeking guidance is to know that his presence is to know that God reveals himself as Jehovah Shama, the Lord who's there. Well, now let's unpack some of these truths and introduce some new ones that you probably didn't know. I want to, let's examine the biblical narrative of Jesus and the woman at the well. And this is what I'm going to read verses 1 through 9, first of all. In St. John chapter 4, verses 1 through 9, it reads like this in the New Revised Standard Version. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard, Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples who baptized, he left Judea and started back to Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well, and it was about noon. So Jesus, we can see his humanity here. He was pretty much tired in the flesh, and it was about noon, and at that, in that particular region, similar to what we have here and in other places, when I say here, I'm talking about in Arizona, and in other places, that high noon is the hottest part of the day. So Jesus was tired, but he probably was also pretty hot. Well, in the interim... This episode leads him to a Samaritan woman. And verse 7 says, A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it? You, a Jew, asketh a drink of me, a woman of Samaria. For this time, Jews did not share things in common with the Samaritans. So let's read on it. Let's, let's begin to expound upon this. So what have we learned here about Jesus and the woman at the well? Number one, Jesus inserted himself 
into the woman's routine, into her time. He interrupted what she normally was involved in, and he showed up in a way to where she could not escape his presence. Jesus wanted to unveil that there was more meaning to her life than what she had been or what she was used to doing. Thirdly, there existed in Jesus' time two important restrictions upon human interaction. A. The Samaritans and the Jews had no dealings. B. It was uncustomary for a man to engage with a woman in this manner openly. Well, Dr. Guthrie, in, um, in the New Bible Commentary, and along with a few others, gave this particular uh, elaboration about these two restrictions. This is quoted. It was unusual for a woman to visit the well alone. She may have been considered something of a social outcast. John adds a note that the disciples were absent, as we see in verse 8. This was important to highlight, highlight the dialogue between the woman and Jesus. Jesus' action overcame two Jewish prejudices, conversation with a Samaritan and conversation with a woman. The racial prejudice is heightened by the woman's remark we find in verse 9. Jesus must have anticipated her complexity for he used it to deepen the conversation. You know, God has his own way to lead us in and to deepen the conversation or to deepen our experiences with him, even in ordinary matters such as this. Here's the reflection. Just like then, Jesus is still trying to expose restrictions upon human socializations such as biases and discrimination which God did not put there. Some of those biases and discriminations are ethnic, cultural, sexist, and even religious. Well, let's read on a little bit further here in the Gospel of John and we're going to read from verse 10 through 18. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is, who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us the well? And with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But those who drink of the water I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and then come back. And the woman answered, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You're right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you're now with is not your husband. What you have said is true. So what can we take from that? 
we find out, number one, well, we find out, first of all, that Jesus takes this encounter with the woman to a whole new level. There are certain episodes in our life that God is taking us on a journey to a whole new level. First of all, he says to the woman, if you knew the gift of God, you would have asked him for living water. Jesus is trying to expand this woman's sense of spiritual perception. He was trying to bring fresh meaning out of an old location. Number two, give me this water so I don't have to come back here. Jesus said to her, go call your husband. This woman's encounter became a kairos moment, a prophetic, deep, revelatory experience. She said, I have no husband. And Jesus said, you have had five, and the one you're now with is not yours. Thirdly, from this we find that Jesus is penetrating the darkness in her life before she uncovers a brand new sense of purpose. This was her point of spiritual renewal. This was her time of spiritual breakthrough. She had been coming back to this well out of routine over and over again. Pretty much had a lifestyle that was, that was lackluster as it were. That was suspect as it was. And this is what she was caught up in. Yet Jesus, by showing up in her own routine, by confronting her right where she's at through a dialogue, we find that it was a kairos moment for her. It was just not a time for her to go and get water from the natural well, but it was a time for her to discover that she's standing before a well of living water, spiritual water that will give her everlasting life. This was her point of spiritual renewal. This was her time of spiritual breakthrough. Reflection, many times you and I have been so short-sighted that we haven't seen God unfold himself in everyday experience. Some of you that are bivocational, have been wishing and wanting to get out of that second vocation so that you can just give yourself to the work of the church. Yet many times we're so blinded by the ambition to become quote unquote full-time ministers that we don't see the well of living water that's springing up in our outside secular vocational experience. God is trying to tell some of us that there is more to your life than what you're caught up in. Sometimes we have to do an inventory of and try to find out what we're caught up in. I got good news for you. That whatever has got you hang, hung up, guess what? Jesus was hung up for all of our hang-ups. Whatever we're caught up in, God is still trying to get our attention and let us know that your life is more than what you're currently involved in. Your life has more meaning. Your life has more value. Your life is greater than the bonds and the chains that have you currently bound. This woman, like many of us, was bound. Yet, Jesus found the way to penetrate her darkness, found the way to give her a revelation about where she was by reading her mail and pointing her into a fresh living and fresh direction that she had never seen before. Sometimes the darkness in our own life can block us from receiving our assigned harvest. So we need to come, and I'm speaking to people of faith and those who are seekers. We need to come to Jesus who is the light of our life 
and allow the light to shine through the cracks in our life so that we can draw life from the light even the midst of a cracked up life or cracked out life. Sometimes we must break up before we can break through. Let's read on a little bit further and we find here in verses 19 through 26. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. She could pick up on that pretty quick. Her eyes are open now because of this Kairos moment that she was involved in. Then she gets religious on Jesus. You know, Jesus wanted to reveal some things to her. So let's see what comes out of her mouth through this encounter. And she says, our ancestors worship on this mountain. But you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. But the hour is coming then he went on to say, rather, excuse me. He says, you worship what you do not know. But we worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. Then he goes on to say, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship Him. God is a spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. The woman said to Him, I know Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When He comes, He will proclaim all these things to us. And Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. So what can we draw from that? Jesus uncovers bad theology and introduces a new theology. Sometimes you're, he, she was so caught up in the tradition of her culture that she had no idea as to who you're worshiping or how to worship. He makes it very clear the nature of true worship. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and also in truth. Jesus takes the limits off of old perceived locations of worship and leads her understanding to a living spiritual reality which is everywhere. Jesus validates then and for now that the church is without walls. Reflection. Are we so caught up in our tradition that we have lost sight of the true and living God? Do we think that God can only be worshipped in brick and mortar houses of worship? I think there's some things that we can, we can, we can learn here that especially when you go into other countries and you begin to see, especially in third world countries, whether it be Africa or some other places, that they don't have all the bells and whistles when it comes to the kind of locations and brick and mortar houses of worship. Sometimes it just might be outside under a tree. Sometimes it might be a thatched roof that is made up of, uh, of palm branches or, or, or the like. And yet, those buildings, as it were, are really not the church. But the church gathers in those buildings to worship the true and living God. 
And here's my other point here of reflection. Have we not learned that the church is not a building, but the people? Now, let me say something. When the disciples and Jesus were gathered together, and this is found in, in, the, in the Gospel of Matthew, I think it's in 16 or 18 uh, chapter, he asked the disciples, what's the word on the street about me? He says, who do people say that I am? And they reported that some say you are Elijah or one of the prophets. And then he turns to his disciple. What do you say? And Peter, in the midst of the 11, makes a bold statement. And he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. In other words, this understanding about who I am, this revelation is, 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 did not come from a human factor. In fact, it came from an omnipresent, true, and living God. He is the one that has opened up your eyes to see who I am. And Jesus went on to say, he said, and it is upon this rock that I will build my church. Now, there's a lot of different interpretations about that, but I want to ascribe to this one. And that is the rock that Jesus was talking about. Yes, Peter's name means rock, but the rock that he's talking about of how he's going to build his church, he was eluding that is people just like Peter, who have a revelation of who I am. It is from this group of people that the church is formed and that the church shall flourish. And that church does not require, oh, does not require brick and mortar. That church is without walls wherever they choose to gather. Now, here are a few metaphors about church that sound good. And I'll be the first to admit that I've used some of these metaphors. But the question is, are they really true? We are going to church. Or church was off the chain. And man, we had church. Now, those of us that live in experiences or live in communities where we understand these phrases, we need to understand this, that they're just simply metaphors about an experience and a location. But the fact is that the church, and the Greek word for church is ekklesia, is, is and always will be the people not the building on the corner, no matter how many bells and whistles that it may have. Not the location. It is wherever the people are gathered together in the name of Jesus. And Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name. He said, there I am in the midst of them. Well, let's read on a little bit further. I wanted to kind of build up to this whole point about harvest. So I wanted to see the backstory behind the harvest that I'm going to talk about today as we wrap this up. Reading verses 27 through 42, we find these words. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, what do you want or where, why are you speaking with her? 28. The woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? Then they left the city and were on their way to him. 
Meanwhile, while they were leaving Samaria and on their way to Jesus, meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, you need to eat something. It's time for you to get something to eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. But I like the way the King James puts it. I have meat to eat that you know not of. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. And Jesus said to them, My meat or my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. And then he tells them, Do you not say, Four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around and see how the fields are ripe and are ready for harvesting. In other words, I don't want you to come to the conclusion by looking at the natural order of things and to say, based upon the way it is right now in this season, harvest time is four months off. I want you to elevate your thinking. I want you to become transcendent in your understanding and to realize that this is a Kairos moment and that I am talking about the kind of harvest that does not exist because of seasons and times based upon agriculture. But I want you to see the harvest is already waiting for you to reap. And it goes on to say in verse 36, the reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Notice how they overcome. Notice how they got a breakthrough because of this woman's testimony. When God has done something specific in your life, don't shut your mouth. You need to share it with somebody because your testimony can bring somebody else closer to Jesus, can bring somebody else into an experience that can become renewal or a breakthrough. The woman's testimony was very simple. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with him and he, and he stayed there two more days. And many more believed because of his word. 42, they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is truly the savior of the world. Well, what can we take from this as we begin to wrap up our time today? Number one, now this is a turning point in the narrative where the shift moved from the woman to the disciples. Again, we reiterate what we already have said. Say not that there are four months, then come the harvest. Lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they're white already to harvest. What in the world was Jesus talking about? What kind of harvest was he referring to? He was talking about the harvest of souls. This woman became a seed that God planted and in Samaria. And as a result, we find that a church was born out of Samaria. Jesus was basically saying through this encounter with the woman, look, I've got a plan. I want to plant a church in Samaria and I need the least likely candidate of this kind of person to do it. See, God doesn't always use people that are polished or use people that have certain accolades or even certain degrees. God sometimes will use you right where you are. Where you've been in your mess, God will raise you up and give you a message. 
you know, where you have gone through a test, God will raise you up and give you a testimony. He does not have to have you to be perfect. You can just have faith and be imperfect and become a vessel of honor, meet for the master's use. The woman, in this case, became the seed of a future harvest. Jesus was simply saying, I need my disciples to prepare themselves for the kingdom of God to enter into a place that you have despised until this day. Jesus, in his encounter with the woman, has now broken down, has exposed the, the bias, has exposed the prejudice, has exposed the discrimination, and has broken all that down and exposed their, and, and said basically, look, I want to expand the kingdom at a place that you didn't think could be blessed. Many times we have thought and given up on certain people because they're not coming around to our point of view or they won't, they won't join our church or they left our church to go to someone else's church. Notice I use the word someone else's church. The point is, is that they're God's people. And the other point is, no one has to live according to your expectations anyway. We all have to live according to God's expectations. And the expectation of God we find somewhere between the book of Genesis and the book of Revelation. And it's from that book that God can give us fresh revelation. He can give us Kairos moments where we find that we become the people in the passage or the person in the passage and make meaning out of your own life so that you can encounter spiritual renewal and Spiritual breakthrough. My final reflection that I want to share with you today is this. God needs some least likely candidates to expand his kingdom. Are you one of them? He needs some disciples who are not short-sighted about the what, the when, and the where of their Assigned harvest. Well, I trust you've been blessed today by harvest time. What time is it for you? Part two. Now, there's a part three coming, which we'll talk about the next time we gather. And until we do, may God bless you. And I'll see you real soon. <music>